The content of this podcast is provided for general informational and entertainment purposes only and is not intended as legal advice. The content of this podcast does not establish an attorney-client relationship between the hosts or the guests and the general audience. If you need specific legal advice for your legal matter, please contact an attorney in your area. This is the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. This show examines the latest legal topics and news facing families whose loved ones have been injured in a nursing home. It is hosted by lawyers Rob Schenk and Will Smith of Schenk Smith LLC, a personal injury law firm based in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to the show. Hello out there and welcome to episode 50. The big five zero. The big five zero and welcome to 2018. 2018. Wow. Also the year that we turn the big four the zero. The big four zero. It's good to be back. We were on hiatus for um, the holidays and the new, and new yeah. year. Um, so it's good to be back in the in the driver's seat, in the catbird seat um, for 2018. Um, a lot of good things. In, I had a good time in Brazil, theoretically. <laughs> I had a great time in Brazil with Daniela's family. Went to Curitiba, went to Endial, yeah. had some acai bowls. Uh huh. Um, drank. They have. So that's how you pronounce it. Is acai? Yeah. This the C with the little. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ding dong is a, a, like an S sound. Yeah. This is Portuguese. Yeah. His, and his girlfriend is is Brazilian. They speak Portuguese. And they have this thing. It's it's delicious. Not so much. We don't have it here very much. But it's a. Uh, um, they take re- literally sugar cane. And put it into a juicer, and you drink sugarcane juice. Oh, good lord! And they and and this is one of those things that you learn when you go somewhere that you wouldn't know this if you weren't there. Mm-hmm. Is is when you go to the street vendor for it, and they pour you the the cup of sugarcane juice. Remember, it's summertime there, and they give you the sugarcane juice when they pour it up, and you give them their two highs and like two dollars, and you drink it. You can go, hey, may I have some more? And they have to pour you some more. Oh, it's for free. Cu- it's yeah, it's customary. Ah. And I felt bad about that. Like, no, don't give them any more money because they're supposed to. It's like it's included. But anyway. Ah. So you just stand there like – Well, you one time. It's oh, a one, one time. It's a good one time. And so that was my uh, holidays. How was your holidays, Will? Uh, I mean, you know, they were great. What oh, do you – I mean, God. we've already discussed I this. I, I don't I – mean, You think after 50 episodes, I would know to not ask Will anything. But anyway, I, so um, – Anyway, so what what do we have on the horizon for this episode, Will? So we have a a, a very uh, good friend of mine, uh, attorney Richard Armin, um, and, and I think I mentioned this last time. Um, Richard's wife, Kyleen Armin, um, was uh, Kyleen Farmer in law school, and she and I uh, were best friends, still are best friends, um, and um, so I've known Richard now. Uh, a uh, long time, like almost uh, almost seven years, because uh, they started dating right at the end of law school and then got married soon after that. It's like the Us Weekly version of who our guest is. <laughs> yeah, well, they're cl- very close to me. I mean, uh, these are uh, two of my best friends. Uh, anyway, but Richard started off um, as a uh, prosecutor in the, in the solicitor's office of Gwinnett County. Um, it's the office that handles um, uh, Gwinnett State Court and Gwinnett Recorder's Court misdemeanor and traffic violation cases, including cases that are bound over from municipal court. Um, from November uh, 2007, which is when I started law school, through January of 2011, uh, just a year after um, me and Kyleen graduated, then he... Um, uh, he became the uh, supervisor, the lead assistant solicitor general of trial division. Um, and um, from that, he was hired in January of 2011 uh, in the district attorney's office, which handles felonies. Uh, so the the more severe uh, criminal cases. He worked there for over six years as a felony prosecutor. First, as an assistant district attorney from 2011 through 2014 and um, he quickly rose to the position of supervisor in in a felony trial courtroom as a senior managing assistant uh, district attorney from january 2014 until he left in may of 2017 
Uh, now, he was the lead attorney in cases involving murder, rape, armed robbery, aggravated assault, drugs, theft, and all other levels of, of felony cases. And he had the, uh, the nickname of Trial Dog in the district attorney's office for taking trials, um, for taking cases to trial the most in one calendar year. I mean, so he, this guy is a trial attorney. He now practices in the areas of plaintiff's personal injury and wrongful death cases. His office, the Armand Firm, LLC, is located at 260 Constitution Boulevard, Lawrenceville, Georgia, um, one mile from the Gwinnett Justice and Administration Center, which is the Gwinnett County Courthouse. Um, and we're going to put his contact information up on the screen. Gene, can we get uh, Richard's contact information up on the screen? And Gene, yeah, Gene go. is our producer. Yeah. Anyway, Richard, we are so happy to have you on the show. Welcome. Great to be here. Awesome, Richard. That's thank you, Will. Um, so, Richard, um, it's my understanding that you um, prosecuted an individual. Uh, for elderly abuse under a particular statute in Georgia that um, it's not necessarily geared towards facilities and nursing homes, but it's geared towards those caretakers like family members or maybe um, home care individuals that that um, oversee uh, those with uh, special needs uh, that prevents, you know, exploitation, financial exploitation, abuse, negligence, that kind of thing. Can you, um, from because we always talk about the civil component to right. these cases, suing we, we, these people exactly in civil, court. in civil court. We never talk about we not never we don't go through the actual trial process from from a criminal statute uh, uh, com, um, angle. So that's kind of what we wanted to, to kind of have you on and, and talk about. What's your experience? I know that you've done one of these at least one of these cases under the exploitation statute. Can you walk us through the facts of that case and kind of how it shook down? Absolutely, I'd be glad to. Um, well, for, first of all, the official code of georgia has specific provisions in it that protect elder persons as well as disabled adults um, from abuse from exploitation um, those are found in title 16 which is the title under the georgia code that applies to crimes and offenses um, so totally separate area than than the civil arena that, that y'all have practiced in and done such a good job for but it's title 16 chapter 5 article 8 is where the statutes that protect elder persons are found. And the two main statutes that apply um, are 16-5-101, which applies as to neglect to a disabled adult, elder person, or resident. Um, and the second one is 16-5-102, which is for exploitation and intimidation of disabled adults, elder persons, and residents. Um, or obstruction of an investigation. And I've, I've handled several cases, um, specifically in this area, in my time as a prosecutor. Um, and one of them actually went to trial with kind of a strange in ending, and it's, it's kind of a, a long story, um, but it's actually kind of an interesting case. It was one that had some media attention, and I'll keep names out of it, um, but it was an individual that was charged with a crime um, for going on an elder man's property who lived by himself at a home in Wilburn, Georgia, in Gwinnett County. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I remember this. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. I just, <laughs> I just now realized that I remember this case, and I remember talking with you about it. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Sorry, Richard. The, 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 the particular defendant ran a tree service company, going to people's houses, cutting down trees. So he and his crew of two other other people working with him show up at this man's house unannounced and knock on his door and tell him, hey, you've got old trees on your property and they need to be cut down. Um, there's no evidence whatsoever that there was anything wrong with these trees. He had a nice wooded lot on his property. Um, he lived by himself. His, his spouse was deceased. Um, but trying to make it on his own, and, and he was not in a in a facility of any type, assisted living facility or nursing home. Um, but the, the, these individuals showed up at, at his residence unannounced and tell him, you've got trees that need to be cut down. Um, they proceed without obtaining permission from him um, to go on his property, and they cut down about seven or eight different trees on his property. Um, and 
as far as the professional level of services that they provided, it was just not what you would expect from a tree service. You're talking stumps five or six feet off the ground, not even cut down to a to an actual stump. Um, trees were left there on the property, not cut up, um, not brought to the roadside. Um, and then they go inside his house after cutting down seven or eight trees on his property and demand payment of uh, several thousand dollars from this from this man. Um, and he told the police that he was scared. Um, these people were in his home. He was afraid of what was going on. He wrote the check to them um, for tree cutting services where trees, yes, they were cut down, but it's not anything that anyone paying for tree services would expect. And none of these trees even needed to be cut down. Um, and essentially, this was when I was relatively new to the district attorney's office where I had spent several years handling misdemeanor offenses. It was one of my earliest felony trials. It was within the first year I was in the district attorney's office, probably my um, third or fourth trial at that point. Um, the previous prosecutor in the, in the case had actually charged the case, even though there was a specific statute. It was found at a different part of, of Georgia law at that time. Um, the statutes have since been amended to get, provide greater protection to um, elder persons under Georgia law. Um, even though there was an exploitation statute in place at that time, um, they char- the, the previous prosecutor had presented a indictment to the grand jury and charged this individual with robbery for uh. essentially taking money from the presence of this elder person by intimidation. Yeah, okay. And this case was several years old when I inherited it. Yeah. And over the course of, of the several years, and as y'all know, in some of these cases, they are very difficult to prosecute, whether criminally or prosecute a civil claim. Um, when when you have an elder person um, that's in later stages of their life. And this man was, was undergoing the beginning signs of dementia. And he would have good days where he re- could recall things that happened. He would have mm-hmm. bad days where he couldn't testify as to much of what happened. And and frankly, he had forgotten a decent amount, uh, amount of what had happened by the time it got to trial. Yeah. Um, but I inherited it as a robbery case. And, and we tried that case. And um, he was brought into court in a wheelchair. Um, he couldn't take the witness stand. He had to be wheeled into the well of the courtroom um, and sat in front of the jury for direct and cross-examination. Um, and he was able to recollect um, a few of the details as to what had happened to him. Um, and then in the prosecution of the case, I was able to, through the police officer that had interviewed him, um, essentially get in his prior um, inconsistent statement, basically to impeach my own witness um, with the extra details that he was no longer able to testify to um, in these later stages, two to three years after it actually happened to him. Oh, that's clever, dude. That's awesome. So yeah. It, 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 it was actually an interesting case, um, but the difficult part was, it was a case that really should have been charged initially as exploitation of an elder person and not as robbery um, because the statute is much more favorable. Um, it uses terms um, in the exploitation statute that you hear a lot of times in civil law um, because this was a financial exploitation case. And the definition under Georgia law, the definitions are at 16.5.100. Exploit means illegally or improperly using a disabled adult or elder person or that person's resources through undue influence, coercion, harassment, duress, deception, false representation, false pretense, or other similar means. Okay, so, so I was, was going to say, so it, it, it just so happened that they, I mean, it, do the facts, I guess my question would be this. So they're driving down the neighborhood looking to see who they can they can basically misrepresent what they do to and they come to this guy's house that has trees in his yard so does the does the law say that they have to know that the person is elderly when they come in with the the, the idea of bilking somebody for yard or lawn services or how, how does that how, how does that work in terms of intent it it as, as for an intent if a person is 65 years of age or older they qualify under Georgia law as an elder person. Okay. Um, if the person committing the crime against them in good faith believes that the person, let's say, for example, is 58 years of age, it would be irrelevant to the crime. Um, if 
as long as the person on the date of the crime is 65 years of age or older, the crime applies to them, the jury would be charged on that. The knowledge of age is not an essential element of the crime. The state has no burden of proving that the defendant knew the person was 65 years of age or older. That would be the same as when you deal with crimes against children. Um, for exa- example, sexual crimes, where the it's age of consent liability. in Georgia is 16. If, if someone is 15 years of age on the date of a crime being committed against them, that was a voluntary act, um, but they cannot legally consent, it would be the same thing if the person engaging in that act believed that the person was 18 years of age and not 15, it's irrelevant. The law still applies. Um, so all we had to do uh, on that front, if it had been charged properly, um, was show that this individual was 65 years of age or older, and he was well into his 70s on the date of the offense. Mm. Okay. Um, so yeah, if, if there's a Benjamin Button issue where you've got somebody who's aging backwards and they're they look like they're 17, but they end up being 65, it doesn't matter. Yeah, there's so. no Benjamin Button defense. Is what no you're saying. Benjamin Button defense. Exactly. So, um, and and Richard, um, so the the statute that you mentioned, the exploitation statute, this is just dealing with financial exploitation, misrepresentation, or some type of subterfuge in order to get the, to bilk the money from an elderly person. Well, well, the particular statute that's the definition definition of exploit. Um, but this particular statute, sixteen dash five dash one hundred two, um, it criminalizes any person who knowingly and willfully exploits a disabled adult, elder person, or resident, and it also criminalizes any person that willfully inflicts physical pain, physical injury, sexual abuse, mental anguish, or unreasonable confinement on such persons. Um, And it also applies to willfully depriving those persons of essential services. So it's kind of a broad statute that it goes towards financial exploitation. It goes towards infliction of physical pain. It also goes towards depriving essential services to those people. Um, So it gives a great deal of protection under the criminal laws to elder persons, disabled adults, um, and and persons that fall in those categories under Georgia law. And there's also a separate... 16.5.101 16.5.101 for more negligent type offenses against a neglect to a disabled adult, elder person, or resident. Does that, does that sort of make sense as far yeah, as the criminal yeah. statute? Yeah, yeah and absolutely. Just, just so our listeners are clear on this, what because this guy was was indicted for robbery, What how, how, does you, how do you define robbery? What are the elements? Well, the particular type of robbery um, we were dealing with was taking um, property, which would be the check um, for United States currency from the immediate presence of the victim um, by intimidation. There are multiple ways. There's armed robbery. There's regular robbery. Robbery can take place by intimidation. It can take place by force. Um, It can take place by sudden snatching. This particular robbery was charged as a robbery by intimidation. But they were there They performed these services that the guy did not want and intimidated him into writing that check for them. Um, Robbery carries a penalty under Georgia law of up to 20 years in prison. Um, It's a one up to 20 year offense. However, the exploitation statute, which would have been a better way for it to have initially been charged, also carries the exact same punishment range of one up to 20 years. However, instead of having to prove committing an act of intimidation, um, it, it's, it was a much easier case if it, to be able to prove if it had been char- charged on the elder person exploitation statute because you can show with the work that was done, you don't have to show that that intimidation occurred. You could show uh, that this was undue influence, this was deception for things we did that we didn't really do because they didn't do tree-cutting services as anyone would expect paying for such services. Um, harassment, coercion, any of those would have applied if it had been charged properly in the beginning. And it was sort of a case that I had inherited, and it was old as dirt, and go in there and try this case. You made lemonade. You you get in there, you get a caseload, and you gotta gotta get in there and get your cases moving, you gotta get them tried. People need justice, and we couldn't sit on this case because um, the, the older it got, the weaker it was getting because of the ability to testify 
from the victim in the case. So, Richard, um, um, with regard to that, in terms of how it was indicted and such, can you? If, uh, most of our listeners are individuals that have loved ones in nursing homes, okay, or have loved ones that are possibly on their way to, to the nursing home. And maybe they suspect that somebody that's their caretaker, maybe that's their cousin or their brother, or somebody is, is either financially exploiting them or abusing them, and it would be applicable under this criminal statute. Um, is it is Do you have an understanding as to what their steps should be? Do they call 911? Do they call the sheriff's office? And if they do, is the sheriff's office going to say, this is more of a of a civil matter if somebody's taken somebody's money can you kind of kind of walk us through that and give us your perspective on that absolutely um if if they believe that one of their loved ones in a in a assisted living facility nursing home any situation such as that is being either financially exploited in any way or physically abused in any way or being neglected to the point where it's affecting um the health and well-being of that person um, it is potentially a crime under the, the two statutes applicable, 16.5.101 and 16.5.102. Um, they, they should contact the local um, law enforcement authority in the area where their loved one is residing in the facility. Um, if this were somewhere in, for example, where I've practiced most of my career, unincorporated Gwinnett County, you would contact the Gwinnett County Police Department. If it was, for example, in the city limits of Sewanee in Gwinnett County, Georgia, you would contact the Sewanee Police Department um, based on, essentially, if you were to call 911 from that facility, what, what department would, res- would respond to it? Um, in more rural counties of Georgia, you're going to be dealing a lot of times with a sheriff's department. And Gwinnett obviously does have a sheriff's department, um, but the police handle more of the criminal investigations. The sheriff's department in Gwinnett handles... Um, security at the jail, running the jail, courtroom security. They do some law enforcement aspects. They do have a drug task force. Um, but you would contact the local law enforcement o- office um, where the facility is located to make the report. And it would be taken seriously. Um, most departments have people assigned um, to handle these cases, special victims unit detectives um, or Sometimes, if it's a financial one, it'll be assigned to a financial crimes detective. Okay. Um, but the, these cases typically are taken very seriously by law enforcement um, when there is this type of evidence okay. that yeah. someone's being financially exploited or abused, neglected, um, those type of things. Right. So, okay, so let's step into the shoes of that individual. She's contacted the sheriff's department um, and she has told the investigator this happened um, to my loved one. In terms of moving that case forward, when it, you know, does it, does that, is that when it gets to, well, theoretically, when you were doing this, it was that when it got to your desk? Like, what's the next step? So they have, do you, and do you interview the, do you interview them or how does that work? The, the, the typical way, and, and in the district attorney's office, we would get a lot of calls from people um, sort of making reports. And the, the, the way it happens is they get referred back to, to where the investigation commences, which is the local police department. The local police department will investigate a crime and forward the results of their investigation when they find probable cause to charge a person, or sometimes when they're not sure if there's probable cause to charge a person with a crime, they will then forward it on to the district attorney's office for further review. Um, but essentially, it's a local law enforcement um, agency that does the investigation when they complete their investigation, it would get forwarded onto the district attorney's office for review. Um, it gets assigned to an individual prosecutor on the case who then um, makes the decision whether to file charges by way of an indictment, which is a presentation. And, and I know a lot of this stuff is, is kind of foreign to the listeners, but I'll try to explain it as best as I can. You file what's called an indictment, which is basically a piece of paper that charges a person with a crime. And it gets presented to what's called a grand jury, which is a group of citizens that hear um, all the serious cases and vote on whether to do what's called returning a true bill of indictment, which formally charges a person in superior court with a crime, or a no bill, which means they've declined um, to give authorization to prosecute a case in superior court. And the case is sort of done at that point unless there's a second presentation um, made to a different grand jury at a later date. Um, but it, but the individual prosecutor has great discretion. 
And in most offices, as in the, the way Gwinnett County works is when one prosecutor makes the decision, they have a supervisor that then reviews that decision. So there's a second level of check to make sure that decision is the correct decision that, that has been made, whether to prosecute a person or whether to decline a prosecution. But most of the time, I would say over 90% of the time when the police have taken a warrant and, and charged the person or arrested a person for a crime, I would say over 90% of the time that case is going to end up getting prosecuted in Superior Court. Um, if, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, yeah no, no okay, so that that's th- thank you very much for for that Richard. That was that was great. So let's let's take it from where it hits your desk. Like how is the loved one who's who's I'm sorry, how is the family member, the loved one who has been exploited? How are they involved in the process? And I'm in my hypothetical to you the individual that's been exploited might not have the might have cognitive impairments and they might not be able to be a witness so it's the loved one that's doing this are they how are they involved in the investigation do you meet with them like do you get documents that kind of thing how do you build your case absolutely well typically the the police officer or the police detective is going to have met with them already and, nice. and obtained a statement and obtained all the documentation that that they felt was necessary um, to take action, to take a warrant and charge a person by warrant and arrest the person. Um, and they will also attempt to interview the loved, loved one, if that's possible also, um, to build their case. That then, when the, the prosecutor gets it and you make the decision to charge the crime by indictment and it makes its way to a trial calendar, when you prepare for trial, you never take a case into court without preparing for trial by interviewing all of your witnesses. So so the loved one that makes the report, um, the prosecutor, either in the, in the prosecutor's office, or it's not uncommon um, to go out in the field and meet with a person at their place of work if they choose to, their home, um, try to be convenient for the witnesses on the state side. You meet with them and go over all of the facts of the case, all of the documents, um, see if there's anything that's missing that, that needs to be added to the case to be served in discovery to the other side um, and you prepare your case by interviewing the loved one and interviewing the victim as well um, an example in that tree cutting case i mean the prior prosecutor had been out to the victim's house and interviewed him he had um he he, he really didn't have any family in the area there, there was an individual that assisted him a friend of his uh, he was interviewed as well and he was um, a potential witness in the case as well um, that that individual was, was interviewed the, the caretaker as well as the victim in preparation for trial. Um, the police officer that interviewed the victim was interviewed um, in preparation for trial. Mm-hmm. Uh, and something we didn't uh, we we didn't cover. What happened with the case? Uh, it, it was a a very strange outcome and something I I have never seen before. Um, have either of you ever heard of the crime of embracery under Georgia law? Of in what? Embracery. No. That is what happens when someone tries to influence a juror in their decision on a case. And essentially what happened with the case is um, after one, probably about the second day of trial, the first day was mainly jury selection, the second day was putting up evidence, um, the jury got sent home for the evening. Um, and when they were walking to their vehicles in the parking lot, this particular defendant was on bond and went up to some of the jurors and said, do the right thing, do the right thing by God. Um, and it's a crime of embracery that with the intent to influence a person serving as a juror, communicating with them um, in an attempt to influence their action as a juror. Huh. So the next morning we're, we're sitting there ready for court to resume and bailiff comes in with a note um, that a juror wants the judge to know what happened in the parking lot and then all the jurors had to be brought back in questioned um, and essentially a mistrial was declared in the case on the robbery charge and i sort of saw how the evidence came forward and i was i was thinking from before that trial this really should be an exploitation case and not a robbery and i was able to get the benefit of then talking to these jurors that this defendant had committed a crime against which is a felony crime also that if it was exploitation their decision would have been easier because they were basically they had they were 
um, in a split where they couldn't decide. Some were saying not guilty, some were saying guilty. Um, mm-hmm. And essentially what happened with the case then was um, represented to the grand jury charging exploitation. Um, another uh, indictment was returned charging him with embracery, and it resulted in in where he no longer wanted to go to trial, and he did a guilty plea in the case um, when the charges were done properly. And, and for the listeners out there, that's illustra- it, it illustrates the importance of having um, people that are experienced and, and review the case. As I know, um, the lawyers that Shink and Smith do in these cases, that's why it's so important to have attorneys like you guys that practice in a specific area yeah. like nursing home abuse. Um, because with just the experience I gained in that one trial, um, it's so important to start a case off right from the beginning. Yeah. Um, in any case I ever got where there were charges against an elder person and that statute fit, it's such a useful tool to a prosecutor. I would always consider that statute. Um, and, and that's the importance of, of experience in, in areas dealing with elder persons. There are unique laws that, that protect elder persons under under Georgia law, um, and that was a good example of it. Awesome, man. Um, so where are we at, Rob? I think I mean that's I think we um, I think we kind of uh, covered a lot of the exploitation statute, and we're actually we've we've run out of time for this particular episode. Maybe Richard will come next week, and we can maybe squeeze a little bit more out of that exploitation statute. I got a few more questions for him that we might we're not going to get to this episode, but um, uh, thank you very much, Richard, for for coming on the show, Trial Dog. Um, of Gwinnett County. Um, how do people get in touch with Richard, Will? Uh, well, they can uh, they can call his office at 678-661-9585. Um, or you can go to his website, uh, which is um, www.armonlaw.com. And Armon is A-R-M-O-N-D law.com and we'll get gene to put that up we'll on get the gene to, to put that up gene is the producer but again but richard thank you so much for being on the show um and i guess with that uh oh, let me actually I, I always sometimes i forget this but this is a this is an audio and video podcast if yes. you want to listen to the audio you can go to stitcher or itunes or possibly spotify now that it's 2018 who knows what have always in motion is the future um, or you can watch us. We also we obviously prefer that you watch us. Will's always talking about he got a new suit. He's going to wear it, you know, to the next taping of the podcast. He's very materialistic and into his appearance. So he he would really love it if you watch the podcast. Right. And you can do that either on our YouTube channel or at our website, which is nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. And with that, we will see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, and feel free to leave us some feedback. And for more information about the topics discussed in this episode, check out the show website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. That's nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.